The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The dream of millions of Americans is to own their own home and own it free and clear. Now, if you're buying your own home or planning to buy or build, you owe it to yourself to investigate the advantages of the equitable, assured home ownership plan. And you can get all the details just by picking up your telephone. Yes, simply call your local Equitable Society representative. Your future security, your peace of mind, is his business, and you'll be glad to do business with him. In about 13 minutes... I'd like to tell you more about this friendly, helpful neighbor of yours and how he may help you, too, enjoy the many advantages of membership in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Kidnapping. Its title, Wide Open City. America has always been a growing land, an expanding nation pushing toward tomorrow. At this moment, new communities are springing up like gawky adolescents, full-grown before they are hardly aware of it. A sudden oil strike, a giant engineering project, a rich mineral discovery, or a huge industrial development may produce a sudden flow of population and create an overnight metropolis. But too often, criminals and racketeers Lured by easy money and the instability of rapidly developing communities are among the first arrivals at modern frontier towns. Your Federal Bureau of Investigation is always alert to this potential danger and always ready to cooperate with hard-pressed local authorities in matters of mutual interest. The case you are about to hear is a good example of the struggle which sometimes takes place at the 20th century frontier. Tonight's FBI file opens on a riverfront wharf near a recently discovered oil field. Two men are loading heavy crates onto a motor launch tied against the dock piling. In the shadows of a nearby warehouse, a third man silently watches them. That's the last one, Eddie. Okay, get ready to shove off. Hold up a minute, boys. Hmm? I want to talk to you. It's a cop. Yeah, I'll try to stop. What's the trouble? You own this launch? Sure. What about these crates you're moving? They belong to Brad Waterbury. We've been hired to move them. I'd like to see your bill of lading. Now, look, we can't sit here all night, John. This is a rush job. Just come up here and show me your bill of lading, then you can get underway. Okay, okay. Nothing but red tape every time a man turns around. Well, there have been several burglaries along the riverfront lately. I'm just... Stay where you are. Don't try to move that boat. It doesn't look like there's much you can do about it, mister. Well, maybe there's something I can do about you. Where's that bill of lady? You know, I just remembered. I left it on the launch. All right. You're under arrest. Well, what do you know? Come in. You wanted to see me, Chief? Oh, yes. Alderman Hendricks, this is Officer Wilton. How do you do, Officer? How do you do, sir? Sit down, Jeff. Thanks. I'm sorry I haven't met you before, Wilton, but I've only been in Riverdale a short time, in part with running for election and organizing the new city government. Well, you understand how it is. Yes, sir. Now, my boy, let's get right down to it. As you know, one of the reasons I accepted public office was because I felt we had to have some real law and order here. And that wasn't just campaign talk. I meant it. 
A boom town like this can get out of hand if somebody doesn't watch it right from the beginning. Well, I'd say Riverdale has already gotten out of hand, Mr. Hendricks. Oh, I know, but that doesn't give us any excuse to go overboard. Overboard? I'm talking about that man you arrested on the dock the other night. Eddie Williams? Yes, I believe that's his name. You should have used a little more discretion. Well, he's one of those wharf thieves who've been operating here for the last few months. I'm positive of it, sir. Well, I'm just as anxious to see those robberies stopped as you are, but Williams is employed by the River Freight Company. He was engaged in a legitimate shipping operation when you arrested him. Well, those crates contain stolen drilling equipment. Brad Waterbury identified them as his property, swore out a complaint. Jeff. Yes, Chief. Waterbury came in to see me this morning. He says he was mistaken. I'm going to have to turn Williams loose. And that means he could bring suit for false arrest. I'll have a talk with him. I hope I can persuade him to forget it, but you see how serious this could have been, Wilton. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, I've got to be going. I'm making a speech at the luncheon club. Nice to have met you, Wilton. So long, Chief. Well, there it is, Chief. I don't want your badge, Jeff. Put it back on. Do you believe I was wrong about that Williams guy? I don't know what to believe anymore. But I need you on the force. I've got eight men, eight cops in a city of 20,000. You were a cop before the oil strike. You know what's happened here. Sure. The whole town's gone rotten. It's wide open. Gambling in half the bars, eight or ten robberies a week. Every cheap hoodlum in the state has moved in on us. That's why you can't, can't quit me now. What good am I to you? Or the other cops either. Every time we, we make an arrest, somebody puts up bail and the suspect skips town. Or if he should come to trial, he has a tight alibi and our witnesses get forgetful, like Brad Waterbury. I know it looks pretty hopeless, but sooner or later, we'll get things back to normal. How? Somebody's giving these crooks protection, fixing it so we can't lay a finger on them. Even our fancy new alderman seems to take orders. Hendricks just happened to be here when Waterbury came in to see me. Yeah. Quite a coincidence. Stick it out a little bit longer, Jeff. We'll get a break. We'll find out who's behind all this. Okay. You know I can't quit, Chief. I don't know how to do anything else except be a cop. But I'll tell you one thing. Hmm? I'm going to have a little talk with Brad Waterbury anyway. I made a mistake, that's all, Jeff. Anybody can make a mistake. You were pretty positive about those crates the other day, Brad. Well, they did look like my stuff, but, well, one piece of drilling equipment isn't much different from another. I should have made certain before I opened my mouth. Then those weren't your tools, is that it? That's it, Jeff. Who convinced you? I don't know what you mean. You reported a couple of burglaries before this one. Now, what if I did? Listen, Brad, if somebody's been putting pressure on you, tell me who it is. Hey, move those crates over there, fellas. All right. Jeff, why don't you take it easy? Look, I've lived here in Riverdale for over 20 years. Never made more than enough to keep my head above water. Now I'm making real money, selling everything I can get in stock. I like things the way they are. You like being robbed? I said I wasn't robbed. Not this time. But even if I was, what's a couple of crates of machinery, more or less? There's lots of other machinery, lots of customers waiting to buy it. I got no complaints. For the first time in my life, this town's doing me a good turn. Eight days later, at a nearby FBI field office, Officer Wilton is talking with Supervisor Dennis Logan and Special Agent Jim Taylor. That's the situation as I see it, Mr. Logan. I'm not sure who's behind these rackets in Riverdale, but somebody's getting a lot of protection. From what you tell me, Chief Douglas isn't involved. No, sir. I'd stake my life on the chief. He hates what's been going on as much as I do, but his hands are tied. We've always found that the vast majority of police officials are honest and efficient. How much do you know about this Alderman Hendricks? Not much. Came to Riverdale right after the first gusher was brought in. Made a lot of friends, got himself elected to office. Uh -huh. Wilton, I wish we could help you. 
We've been getting reports on Riverdale for the last six months. But whoever is running things there has been smart enough to avoid federal law violations. Well, I think I may have found an FBI angle. At least I hope so. Oh, what is it? Well, I've been spending my off-duty hours watching Eddie Williams since he was released from jail. He and an ex-convict named Steve Burgess are running a small river freight business. Could be a front for moving stolen property. That's what I figured, too. Well, anyway, I've seen them load stuff into boats and head down river. And they don't come back till the next day. And the state line's only a few miles downstream, is after driving in? Yes, sir. Do you have any evidence that they carried stolen goods over the state line? Well, no, sir, not real evidence. Mm -hmm. This isn't enough to bring you into the case? No, I'm afraid not. We have to be certain that the matter's within our jurisdiction. I guess I was a little too anxious. Oh, you were absolutely right in telling us what you found out, but until there's a definite federal violation... Yes, well... Well, maybe if I dog Williams a little harder, he'll get nervous and make a slip. I figure whoever's been protecting him is behind all the other rackets in Riverdale. Mm -hmm. Frequently works out that way. But don't take too many chances. Don't worry about me. Thanks for listening, Mr. Logan. Mr. Taylor. Alderman Hendricks speaking. This is Steve Burgess, Mr. Hendricks. I've got a little business problem I'd like to talk over, if you've got a minute. Well, what is it? That fellow you had a little conversation with last Monday. The one who paid us a visit at the wharf. What about him? He's still devoting a lot of time to the neighborhood. Is he finding out any of our business procedures? I'm not sure. But by the way he keeps glued to us, he could. That mustn't happen, Burgess. What do you suggest? Can't you handle a little detail like this without coming to me... You say the person in question spends his evenings on the wharf? That's right. Well? Okay, Mr. Hendricks. I just wanted to get your business, business opinion before I did anything. We'll handle it. Is he still following us? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, here he comes. Anybody else on the pier? No, I don't see anybody. Okay, I'll I'll hide in this doorway. You lead him on until he comes up even with me. All right. Something I can do for you, officer? No. I just like to come down by the river and sort of wander around. Do you have any objections? Why should I object? <laughs> You got him cold, Steve. Help me put him in the boat. He says he likes the river. Let's find out how well he likes it. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Fear about home ownership was a worry that hung over the head of Mr. Elliot Granger until he became a member of the Equitable Society. Wasn't it, Mr. Granger? Yes, it was. Until I heard you describe a plan that seemed to me to be just what the doctor ordered. And that's the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, the AHO plan. Yes. It seemed to be a plan that's tailor-made for people like me. And what did you do? Well, I took your advice and called my local Equitable representative. He explained how the AHO plan would help my wife own it free and clear without any more payments if something happened to me. In other words, it's a low-cost first mortgage plus life insurance protection, all covered by a single payment once a month. Now when my friends talk about buying or building, I tell them to look up my friend, the equitable man. Yes, your equitable man is a good man to know and a good man to do business with. He's a specialist, experienced in all kinds of life insurance. So... Whatever your insurance problem, if you want to own your own home free and clear years before you hoped, if you want to assure a college education for your youngsters, if you want to enjoy a carefree, independent life after 60, if you need financial protection for your wife and children, pick up your telephone. Talk it over with a friendly, helpful neighbor. Your Equitable Society man, there's no obligation. Consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local Equitable representative. 
He listed in the yellow pages under Equitable. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Wide Open City. In numerous communities, law enforcement agencies are hopelessly understaffed. The case you are hearing clearly shows the demoralizing results of such a situation. But even in old and well-established cities and towns, police forces are sometimes not large enough to meet minimum requirements. There is no money saved by ineffective law enforcement. The price of crime is many times higher than the cost of the most effective police force. And you always pay the bill. Real crime prevention is the greatest economy any community can undertake. So don't wait until an outbreak of lawlessness or racketeering causes you to insist on greater protection. Insist on it now. All law enforcement agencies are working for you. See to it that they have the staff to do their job. Tonight's FBI file continues the next morning at the nearby FBI field office. Supervisor Logan is sitting at his desk when Special Agent Taylor enters. You wanted to see me, Mr. Logan? Oh, Jim, you're driving over to Riverdale this morning, aren't you? That's right, sir. We've got a tip. Some slot machines have been shipped in from back east. I'm going to try and run them down. Well, I may have to switch on to something else, at least temporarily. Oh? Just had a call from Chief Douglas. Officer Wilton has disappeared. He didn't come home last night. What? So far, we don't know what's happened to him, and until we do, we can't move in. But check with the chief anyway. Sure. Maybe Wilton just ran into something suspicious. Stayed on the job. Yeah. I'll keep in touch, Taylor. Gentlemen, I'm not going to waste my time telling you what a mess you've made of things. What's wrong, Mr. Hendricks? Wilton, that's what's wrong. You gave me the okay. I didn't think you'd be foolish enough to take him across the state line. What difference does it make where we bumped him off? He isn't dead. What? We put a couple of slugs in him and dumped him overboard. I tell you, he's still alive. They just found his body. He managed to get ashore. If he recovers consciousness, you're through. Fine. Oh, I can handle a small-town hick like Chief Douglas, but I can't handle the FBI in a kidnapping case. What should we do? Get out of town as fast as you can. Take the launch. Go down to Harbor City. They'll find us there, same as they would here. Not if you can keep out of sight for a couple of days. The Rio Paula is due to dock on Friday. Yeah, that's right. If you had any brains, you'd have thought of that yourselves. Well, go on, go on, get moving. Calling Dr. Chanchamino. Dr. Chanchamino, report to the front office, please. Pardon me. Pardon me, I'm looking for Officer Wilton's room. Oh, he's still in surgery, sir. Oh? Well, is uh, Chief Douglas around then? They told me he was here. Yes, sir. He's in the waiting room, just around the corner there. Oh, thanks very much. Chief Douglas? Yes? My name is Taylor, FBI. How do you do? You've heard about Wilton, Mr. Taylor. Yes, sir. Your office informed me. I reported the details to our agent in charge. He assigned me to the case. Good. Tell me, how is he? It's a miracle he's alive at all. He's not able to talk. The doctor says it may be hours, days. He doesn't know when. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'm afraid there's not much we can do. Well, he came to see us a couple of weeks ago about a man named Eddie Williams. He said he'd been following Williams and a friend of his trying to get some evidence on him. I, uh, I don't know whether he told you this or not. He didn't have to. I knew Wilton well enough to be pretty sure that he wasn't going to drop a lead just because somebody put a little pressure on him. Mm -hmm. Well, then maybe we ought to start with Williams. Sounds like he's our best bet so far. I already sent a man down to the freight office to bring him in for questioning. Oh. He and his partner have left town. Their boat's gone and there's no sign of them. I see. I put out an alarm, but I don't think it'll do much good. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, official name of their organization again? River Freight Company Incorporated. Well, thanks, Chief. I'll check with you later. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Logan. What's up, Jim? You remember Wilton telling us that Williams and his friend ran a freight service? Yeah. Well, I've been out of the bank going over the company accounts. Find out anything? Yeah, a couple of things. 
In the first place, the outfit doesn't show any income, just outgo. Oh. Yeah, it runs in the red about, oh, $1,500 a month. Sounds like somebody doing some fancy bookkeeping. Mm. How do they keep making up the deficit? Mm. The company treasurer deposits a personal check about once a month. Treasurer? Yes, sir. Alderman Hendricks. I see. I thought I might have a talk with the alderman before I come back to the office tonight. Use your own judgment. I'll be working late tonight myself. Get All right, sir. I'll bring the records and any information I can dig up. Won't you sit down, Mr. Taylor? Thank you. I'm frank to admit I don't know why an FBI agent would want to talk to me, but if there's anything I can do for well, you... I'm working on the Wilton case. Oh, a great tragedy, Mr. Taylor, but I suppose it's the price that has to be paid for law and order. Mr. Hendricks, do you know a man named Eddie Williams? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. Oh, you don't think he's involved in this vicious attack on Wilton, do you? Is there any reason why I should? No, no of course not. At least no reason I know of. Was Williams a friend of yours? Certainly not an intimate friend. Oh, I think I know what you're driving at, Mr. Taylor. I imagine someone has told you that I interceded for Mr. Williams when he had a little difficulty with Officer Wilton a couple of weeks ago. But I'm a politician, and politicians do have obligations to their constituents. Do you know where Williams is now? At his place of business, I imagine. The freight office is closed. Williams and his partner have apparently left town. That's odd. Well, perhaps they're delivering a shipment somewhere. I'm sure they'll be back in a day or two. If they were planning to be gone for any length of time, they would have notified me. Oh? Yes. You see, I own an interest in a little concern. It isn't common knowledge, but I suppose you'd find out sooner or later anyway. Probably. It's just one of my numerous investments in Riverdale. A town as new as this needs capital. I've tried to supply my share. I see. Is your uh, investment in the freight business profitable? Well, to be very honest, I haven't paid much attention. I suppose in the long run I make a few dollars, but in time I anticipate a very healthy profit. This city is growing, Mr. Taylor, by leaps and bounds. Well, thank you, Mr. Hendricks. I guess that's all for now. <laughs> And these are the monthly bank statements, Mr. Logan. Mm -hmm. oh, here's the canceled checks. Oh, yes, and these are Hendricks' bank statements. That's quite an account, huh? Uh, he also has a safety deposit box. I imagine it's bulging, too. Now, I've consolidated the company checks for the last six months on this ledger, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except for local office expenses. Sorry to Williams and Burgess, the main items are payment for diesel oil to the Harbor City Fuel Company. Looks like they've been buying oil about three times a month. Yes, sir, yeah. Amount would have supplied fuel for an equal number of trips between Riverdale and Harbor City. And we can be pretty sure that's where they've been getting rid of the stolen machinery. Well, I've called the Harbor City police and our field office there. They'll keep a lookout for Williams and Burgess. Good. They have any leads on stolen machine tools? No, sir, not a one. Suppose the tools have been shipped outside this country. They'd bring a bigger price somewhere else. That's right, sir, they would. Let's get over to the library. They have copies of the Harbor City Times. We can check ship movement reports. Here we are. When was the oil purchased last month? Well, the checks are dated the uh, 7th, mm -hmm. the 19th, and the 30th. Oh, sorry. Let's see. In the week of the 7th, SSTL Jackman sailing for Hawaii, the Rio Paula for Central America, the Bessie L for Argentina, and the Phillips and Queen for Antwerp. 19th, you said? That's right, sir. And none of the same ships seem to be in port. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Hmm? The Rio Paula. And the Rio Paula sailed again on the 31st. There's a shortage of machine tools in Central America right now and an oil strike. Hmm. They'd need the same kind of equipment that's being used in Riverdale. Where's the last issue of the Harbor City Times? Uh, here you go, sir. Thanks. And the Rio Paula's in port now, due to sail tomorrow morning. Going on down here, Chief. 
Douglas. This officer said you wanted to see me, that he was supposed to bring me in. That's right, Mr. Henry. If you have something you want to talk about, why don't you telephone me? I'm not accustomed to being treated like some kind of a criminal. Won't you sit down, Mr. Hendricks? Well, I might have expected some kind of nonsense from the chief, but I always heard the FBI was careful and efficient. We try to be. Now, if you don't mind answering a few questions... See here, both of you. I don't know what this is about, but let me remind you, Chief, that I'm a person of some influence in this town, and if I were you, I'd start planning on being retired in the very near future. There may be some changes in the city administration, Hendricks, but I don't think the Chief will be bothered. What are you talking about? There are two friends of yours in the next room making a statement. Friends of mine? Williams and Burgess. They were arrested last night aboard the Rio Paula. Oh. And the captain of the ship's been doing some talking, too. No, I, I wouldn't plan on running for re-election, Mr. Hendricks. You won't be able to do much campaigning. Eddie and Steve were tried in federal court and found guilty of violations of the federal kidnapping statute. Each received a life sentence in a federal penitentiary. Hendricks was also convicted in federal court and was sentenced to a term of 20 years in a federal penitentiary. Tonight's case, based on the activities of a corrupt public official, shows how an entire community may sometimes fall under the control of a criminal in disguise. Fortunately, this is a rare occurrence. FBI files and investigations show that the vast majority of office holders, both elected and appointed, are honest, efficient, and loyal. They are men who devote their lives to the service of their fellow men. But the few exceptions to this rule are all the more despicable because they are a challenge to democratic government. Many people have the mistaken idea that in government there will always be graft and corruption. This is not true and need never be true. Exercise your privilege to vote. Vote wisely and then maintain a continuing interest in the public servants you have elected. Elections are held at infrequent intervals, but men hold office 365 days a year. If one of them should prove derelict in his duty, it's up to you to do something about it. If your dream is owning your own home, get acquainted with your local equitable representative. Ask him about the equitable assured home ownership plan. Now... He's a neighbor you can trust. Perhaps you're interested in independence in your 60s, or education for your children, or future financial security for your family. Well, just consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local equitable representative. You'll find it listed in the yellow pages under Equitable, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Flight to Avoid Prosecution. Its title, The Swamp Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Burt. Your narrator was William Woodson. And Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Tony Caruso, Eddie Firestone, Lou Merrill, Steve Pendleton, Barney Phillips, and Warren Stevens. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time.